thank you all for coming out this evening. I uh, just do want to remind you that we do have another uh, several weeks of uh, presentations in this series on Thursday evenings. But for tonight, I'd like to introduce you to our workshop presenter. Rebecca Kling is a trans educator, activist, and performer who works to elevate the voices of trans people and their allies. Since March 2016, she has been a community storytelling advocate with the National Center for Transgender Equality in Washington, D.C., where she creates and conducts training for trans people and allies to provide story coaching and media preparation. She also maintains a database of about 6,000 stories submitted to that center by the trans community. She has worked with trans and gender variant youth through camps, schools, and theater groups too, and has been named to the Trans 100, which was an annual celebration and list release of 100 trans people conducting excellent work in the United States, as well as being named to the Guild Literary Complex's 25 Writers to Watch. Please join me in welcoming her to lead today's workshop on fostering gender inclusivity in schools. Rebecca Kling. Thank you. How's everyone doing? Good? For realsies good or like the BS good you tell a teacher? Who's for realsies good? Who is like, nope, just the good you tell a teacher? Oh no, what's wrong? Yeah, it's been a long day, it's been a long week. It has been a long friggin' year. All right, so I am Rebecca Kling, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, supporting trans communities, particularly as it relates to school. Uh, these are my cats, Moop and Meep. Uh, Moop is the one on the leash. I take my cats out on leash, which is one of the whitest things about me. Um, and then Meep is the one who's showing it all to the world. So we're gonna talk a little bit about supporting trans community. We're gonna start with um, sort of interpersonal, and then we're gonna think a little bit about more community level, and then thinking about systems level. So schools, businesses, organizations, uh, government, society. And the first thing that I wanna do is I wanna go over language a little bit, because if you're following along, and I'm not gonna go exactly line by line, because you can all read this later, like, no one wants to go to a presentation and watch someone just read from a page. Um, but I'm gonna broadly follow along this. And the first thing that I encourage people to do is to think about their own experience of their gender. Because one of the most important parts of being an ally is being able to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through a way of thinking about gender. It's definitely not the only way, but it's a way that I like because it balances being too simplistic, which leaves people out, with being too complicated, which we can never remember. So, once upon a time, we had this very binary idea of gender, of men over here, of women over here, there's nothing in between, there's no moving across. Bonus points. Does anyone know why we use these symbols, or where these symbols come from? Yes. They are, they're Greek and Roman mythology. And in particular, the female one is either Ares, or uh, rather is either Aphrodite or Venus, and is either Venus's hand mirror, or Venus's hand mirror, that was a weird metaphor. Uh, and then the male one is Ares or Mars, and depending on what sort of anthropological sources you look for, look for is either Ares' arrow, spear, or phallus. So going back thousands of years, we have some very binary ideas of gender. And now we sometimes talk about the idea of this gender spectrum. Because if we just have male over here and female over here, we leave people out. And we don't want to do that. So we have this idea of the gender spectrum, which is flowy and fuzzy-wuzzy and a little vague. So we're going to try and break it down in a way that's a little more helpful and a little more concrete. First up, we've separated out gender and sexuality. So who you are as a gendered being is different than who you're attracted to, right? We're on the same page. Not everyone likes this, 
There are certainly still politicians and religious leaders who are not a fan of the idea of these being separated out, but not all men are attracted to women, not all women are attracted to men. Still with me. All right. But that still leaves this sort of question of, what does gender mean? And when we're looking at this, I want to acknowledge that this is still not a perfect model. Because if you're moving across, if you're less of one, that means you have to be more of the other. And if I said, well, I'm attracted to both men and women, or I'm attracted to no one, I'm not attracted to men or women, it's not really clear on here where that should fall. And so what I would argue is you could take these off the wall, break them in half, stick them in the ground, and you have something that's a little more accurate. And actually, if you look at the genderbred person, which is on the back of here, it's not perfect, but it actually uses that. It says that rather than a spectrum, rather than a, a one thing, that if you're more of one, you're less of the other, we're going to have two things because being more female doesn't mean you're less male and vice versa. You can be both or neither. But that gets really complicated to draw, as you can see from the genderbred person. So we're going to go back to this, but I want you to remember that at any point, you could take these off, break them in half, stick them in the ground, and that would be a little bit more accurate, but also a little bit more complicated. So we have this idea of sexual attraction, but then we have this big fuzzy question of what does gender mean? And I'm going to argue that we're going to take five ways of looking at it. Not because there are only five ways, but because I find five is a nice balance between being too simplistic, men over here, women over here, done, and too complicated. Seven billion people on Earth, we need seven billion beautiful snowflake words for everyone's gender. There's a kernel of truth in that, but we probably couldn't get to it in the next hour. So we want to find something that balances being too simple and too complicated. Now, for that number one, what are we usually told as kids? Boys have a, someone say it. Thank you, penis. Girls have a, vagina. Right, so we have genitalia. And for lots of people, this works. Lots of people say, I'm a boy, I have a penis, done. I'm a girl, I have a vagina, done. And when we get a little bit older in high school or in middle school, we might start to learn about some of those chemicals. Anyone remember what those two big chemicals that are that kick in at puberty? Yeah, and what are those? Hormones. And so we have these hormones. And that's a little more complicated. That's a little more nuanced. That's a little more scientific. And when we get a little more detailed, we might even start talking about the um, way that our genes are coded. And in particular, there's these two pairs of letters we sometimes talk about. Anyone remember those? X and Y. And what are those? Absolutely. And these are all ways of looking at our physical bodies. The meaning of these is super subjective. What it means to have a penis or a vagina, what it means to have mostly testosterone or mostly estrogen, we all have a mix of both, what it means to have XX or XY, the meaning we decide as a culture. But the actual existence of penises and vaginas or of testosterone and estrogen or of XX and XY, that's pretty objective. And when we talk in gender theory land, about physical sex, that's usually what we mean. We mean the physical stuff that you can look at objectively. Now, when you go to class or go to work or come to workshops like these, do you use these three things to determine other people's gender? Let me ask that a different way. When you walked in and saw me standing here, did you use my chromosomes, hormones, or genitalia to tell whether I'm a man or a woman? No, I hope not. So how do you tell? Appearance. Appearance, presentation, expression are different ways of saying that. And there's a giraffe. Um, I have been told that the real way to do memorable slideshows is to have cute animal pictures. <laughs> and it would be so criminal of me to ignore that advice, so I just throw in some animal pictures. So we look at expression or presentation. Now, this one is super tricky because it changes all the time. We wear different clothing going to bed, going to class, going to work, 
although there's that one person who wears pajama pants 24-7, but for everyone else, we change our presentation. And this also changes over time. What it meant to present as a woman in 1917 versus 2017 is different. What it means to present as a woman or a man in New Jersey in 2017 might be different than in Brazil or in France or in Kenya. And those things also change based on age and class and race and all of these other things. But broadly, we have cultural expectations of what it means to look like a man or a woman. And that's usually how we tell other people's gender on a day-to-day -day basis. We look at them and we make sometimes a snap judgment, sometimes it takes a little longer, but we make some uh, uh, guess based on their presentation. Unless you are very good friends with someone, you probably don't know what their chromosomes or hormones are, and unless you're at a really fun party, you probably don't know what their genitalia is. <laughs> what does this list leave out? And what I mean by that is, how do you know your own gender? So I'm going to argue that there's this idea called identity. Gender identity. When you close your eyes and think about yourself, there is something within you that tells you who you are as a gendered being. And for some of us, this lines up with everything else. For some of us, they can say, I have a penis, I have mostly testosterone in my body, I have XY chromosomes, I'm a man. That all lines up. For some of us, it lines up on the other end of, I have a vagina, I have mostly estrogen, I have XX, I'm a woman. But for some of us, it doesn't. And when we close our eyes and think about ourselves and our gender, that gender identity doesn't necessarily line up perfectly with everything else. And in gender theory land, when we talk about gender versus sex, usually what that means is gender is this fuzzy-wuzzy cultural stuff, and sex is the more physical, objective stuff. Again, the meaning is super cultural. The meaning of what it means to have testosterone in your body, or have a penis, or any of that. The meaning of that we decide as a culture, but the existence is a little more objective, whereas this expression and identity stuff is super fuzzy-wuzzy. To give some specific examples, there are people in this room right now who I would say their expression says that they are women, but who have short hair and are wearing pants in a way that 50 or 100 years ago, that expression might have meant something very different. And so the way we think of expression changes over time, and the way we think of identity changes over time. And one of the reasons I like sharing this is it places everyone on equal footing. Because everyone in this room can think about, well, where am I on these? Where are my sliders? I like this because you can think about it as like sliders on a light switch or faders on a mixing board. And you can say, well, what would my life be like if one of these were different? Or what would my life be like if most of these are different? And what's helpful about this is there's language for different configurations. And there's a ton of language. And I'm not going to go through all of it, because honestly, I don't think you need to memorize language to be an ally. I think being an ally is super important. Language can be really helpful. But at the end of the day, I don't think you need a perfect list of language to be an ally. And there is some, um, Ellen, were we able to put these out? So rather than go through each one of these, I'm going to say you can read this later. But the core thing that I'm going to say, we're talking mostly today about trans identity. And what trans identity is, using this model, is it's saying the identity slider, that one on the bottom, isn't in line with those physical sex sliders. So I'll use myself as an example. I am a trans woman, which means language. Language is tough. Some ways to say that. Means the doctor said I was a boy when I was born. Means using these sliders, my genitalia, hormones, and chromosomes 
lined up on the male end, even though my identity slider was over on the female end. And as I grew older, I did what's called transitioning, which means I used some combination of medical intervention, legal changes, and just changing how I present myself to move some of these sliders around. And that's one way to think of gender and to think of identity. And everyone in here has their own configuration on here that I'm going to argue is something that is helpful to think about for being an ally. It's helpful to put yourself in someone else's shoes. I'm going to move a little bit on from this because there's a ton of complicated language and it gets a little overwhelming. I don't know that Dr. McSnuggles is actually a medical practitioner, so I don't know that that's good medical advice. And rather than go over point by point on stuff that you can read, I'm going to try and talk a little bit more on some concrete stuff that um, I feel like is useful for allyship. If there are specific questions, please raise your hand, yell them out, throw a pen, do what you got to do. But for the most part, I'm going to try and not talk as much about language and talk a little bit more about how we work with each other. So there's all of this language. And in a perfect world, and there's some language that maybe can hurt people a little bit more. In a perfect world, I would be able to say, don't be a jerk, and we'd be done. But it's a little more complicated than that. So what I'm going to start with is some of this interpersonal allyship. If you, there's a trans person in your class, or a coworker, or a friend, what do you do? Well, the first thing is, listen and respect what they ask. If someone says, hey, this is the name I'm using, this is the pronoun I'm using, she, her, or he, him, or they, theirs, try and use it. It doesn't mean that you have to perfectly understand. And this can be really tricky, because we want to understand. We're humans, we're curious, we want to learn things. We do not need to totally understand why someone uses language they use to respect it. And I would say that core first step of being an ally, use the language people are asking you to use. And if you don't know, ask politely. Now that asking politely is a tricky one. Because if we haven't thought about this stuff, particular pronouns, he, him, she, hers, they, theirs, that stuff that when we grow up, we're not taught you need to ask. We're grow, we're, when we grow up, we're taught that you just know that. Boys are this, girls are that. It's really simple. And so when you get a little older, when you're in this, in, in this environment, when you're trying to think about allyship, it becomes a little trickier. So a couple of things. Asking means asking politely. There is a big difference if I'm starting a class between saying, what's your name, what's your name, what's your name and pronoun? Because I just said to everyone, there was something there that meant I couldn't figure it out, so now it needs to be a big deal. So if I know as a teacher that that's something I want to do, I would strongly encourage everyone, what's your name and pronoun? What's your name and pronoun? What's your name and pronoun? Similarly, if I'm talking with someone at a party, there's a big difference between, and I'm not going to raise my voice too much because I'm mic'd and I don't want to blow out the speakers. Hey, in the back, yeah, what's your, what's your pronoun? That is very, very different than going up to someone and asking, or saying, hey, host of this party, that person by the punch bowl, what pronouns do they use? Because then I'm doing it in a way that's not calling them out, not singling them out, is respectfully asking that question. Does that distinction make sense? Now, I do want to make a note here, which is that you can't please everyone all of the time. I feel very strongly that asking someone's pronouns respectfully is a really awesome way to be an ally. You may encounter people who think you should just know and are going to be offended by that question. It might be because they are not trans, and so the idea that you wouldn't know someone's pronoun is just surprising to them. Or it might be because they are trans, and they're trying really hard to look a certain way, and so it hurts their feelings that you didn't magically just know. But at the end of the day, we're not psychic. 
And I would much rather have someone upset at me for asking a question politely than for making an assumption. But I want to acknowledge that you can't please everyone all the time. And so when we're thinking about names and pronouns, the other thing is you can use someone's name and pronoun even if it doesn't fit your expectations. If someone is using they, them, and that's new for you and that's tough for you, that's OK. It's still important to try. If someone is presenting in a way that you really are expecting she and they say, please use he, it's OK to mess up. It's OK to be confused. It's still important to try. Does that make sense? But when we're asking questions, we want to think about what do we actually need to know? And in particular, names and pronouns are a big one. If you are interacting with someone for more than about 30 seconds, names and pronouns are really great. If you're in a class with someone, if you're working with someone as a coworker, if you're on a team with someone, names and pronouns are important. Beyond that, Usually not any of your business. And we talked about, you don't need to know what's between my legs to respect me. You don't need to know whether or not I'm on hormones to respect me. You don't need to know if I've legally changed my name to respect me. Those might be interesting. And as someone who likes to gossip, that might be fascinating gossip. It also doesn't mean that it's any of your business. And so when we're thinking about how to support trans people, I want you to think about that balance of what are questions that I need to know, usually just name and pronoun, versus what are things that I might be curious about, but I don't actually need to know. And I'll give some examples. If someone asks if I've had the surgery, it usually means, do I have a penis or a vagina? That's usually what they really mean, but they don't want to ask that, because that feels particularly rude. So sometimes I'll say, well, I've had my gallbladder out. That's usually not what they mean. And sometimes if they say, well, no, have you had gender reassignment surgery? I might turn that around and say, well, how big is your erection? Or how heavy is your menstrual flow? Because when we turn that around, it's none of my business what goes on between your legs. And unless you're asking me on a date, it's probably none of your business what's going on between my legs. And so it's not that those questions are bad, but that they're usually just not any of our business. And in particular, I want you to think about, first, do I need to know it? And second, would it be appropriate if it was turned around on me? If I'm asking about their medical history, would I like it if they were asking about mine? If I'm asking about their legal status, would it be OK if they were asking about mine? And if the answer is no, probably not a question you should ask. Yeah? Can I ask you to speak to uh, since maybe not everybody here knows why a person might choose to use the full pronoun for the single? Absolutely. Yeah, so the question was about why someone might use they, them, which most of us learn as a plural pronoun, as a pronoun for multiple people, for a singular pronoun. And the, the shortest answer is because it feels right for them. But that's not a very helpful answer. And so they, them is a pronoun that we understand culturally as gender neutral. They, them isn't just for men, it isn't just for women. It's gender neutral. If, if I say, they went to the store, you don't know anything about their gender. And so for some people who, going back to going back to Dr. McSnuggles, going back to this idea of identity, some people might say, well, I feel both male and female. Or I identify as neither. I identify as agender meaning one word, agender, as in non-gender, not a space gender. Or I identify as gender neutral or as non-binary. These are all words for different types of identity and experience that aren't just male or female. And some people who have that experience say, and the language that feels right to me, the language that resonates with my identity, is they, them. 
because we understand it culturally, we already use it, they went to the store, and it requires less explanation than some other gender neutral pronouns, because there are other ones out there. And there are definitely people who say, but that's not grammatically correct. And there are a couple of things there. First, going back to that don't be a jerk. If someone is asking you to use certain language, respect that. However, the people who say they, them as singular is grammatically incorrect are just wrong. The um, AP Manual of Style, the Chicago Manual of Style, um, a number of the sort of grammar books agree they, them is okay as gender neutral. And they're, Pardon? The American, the American Dialect Society. And there are examples going back hundreds of years of authors and literature using they, them to be a singular pronoun. So it can definitely take some getting used to. I have a couple of coworkers at the National Center for Trans Equality who use they, them pronouns, and I trip up sometimes. I want to absolutely acknowledge we don't need to be perfect to be allies. And I've been thinking about this stuff most of my life. It still trips me up sometimes. But it is important to me to respect what my coworkers are asking by using they, them. Jay went to the store, they got a Coke, they came back and brought me some Rolos. And if I'm tripping up there, it's my job to do better, not their job to change what is right for them. Does that make sense? And when we're thinking about um, how we use language, the other thing that can be really helpful to remember is all of this stuff overlaps, but it's not exactly the same thing. So talking about expression, I said, just because someone has short hair doesn't automatically mean that they're a man. Just because someone is attracted to women doesn't mean they must be a man. Just because someone identifies a certain way doesn't mean they automatically use certain language. And so when we're thinking about how we want to support people and how we want to be allies, we don't want to guess or assume. Just because Rebecca is trans must mean this about her sexuality, must mean this about her medical history, must mean this about her expression. If I was up here in um, pants, a button-down shirt with short hair, and I said Rebecca, and I use she, her, that would be just as right as me being up here with long hair, makeup, and jewelry. Because one doesn't make me a better woman or more of a woman than the other. And so when we're interacting with trans people in our lives, or when we're interacting with LGBT people in our lives, we don't want to assume that because we know one thing about someone, we know everything about them. And the last thing I'll say right now on this sort of direct interpersonal, one-on-one -on -one allyship, so, you have this coworker or this colleague or this friend or this um, fellow student, and they've come out to you. I'm Rebecca, I'm trans, here is the language I want you to use. You're using that language, you're doing an awesome job. That doesn't mean you can tell anyone else. Because for lots of LGBT people, they might be out in one part of their life, but not the rest. And for trans folks in particular, there's often a period of time, sometimes it's days or weeks, sometimes it's years or decades, where they are out in part of their life, but not somewhere else. Using my experience from my own life, there was a period of maybe six months or a year where I hadn't transitioned at work. I was going to work in boy mode and was using male pronouns and a male name, and I would go home to roommates who were calling me Rebecca and using she, her. Because I wasn't quite comfortable yet at work. And I was still figuring out how to tell some coworkers and figuring out how to transition at work in a way that felt good to me. And so if my um, roommates had outed me to my boss, and there's no reason they would have, that could have hurt me and ultimately could have been really um, both emotionally and potentially financially harmful. And so when we're thinking about in a school environment, simply because someone comes out to you in class doesn't mean that they're out everywhere in their life. 
And if that's something that you feel like is important. So when I was coming out, I was um, still friends with a lot of my friends from high school. And because we were friends going back to high school, I knew a lot of their parents. And so I had a friend, Pete, who as I was transitioning said, hey, Rebecca, can I tell my parents you're transitioning? And I said, yes, absolutely. Thank you for asking. That felt like a really great allyship moment. It would have ultimately, for me, not been a big deal, but it wouldn't have been a great ally moment if he had just assumed he could tell his parents. Does that make sense? And to use a specific example, there was a story in the news a couple years ago of a gay young man who was in the um, gay choir at his school. And the choir director added him to the choir Facebook group. And because Facebook is the worst, it posted on his wall, so-and-so has been added to the gay Facebook group. And his parents saw that, and they didn't know, and they, didn't, they weren't supportive, so they cut him off financially. And it made it that much harder for him to go to college. And so not outing people is, first of all, it's just like not very nice to out people, like it's sort of gossipy and mean, but it can also have really real impacts on people's safety, on people's security, on people's ability to live securely, live in their apartment, go to school, go to work. Does that make sense? All right. So you're being a great ally interpersonally. You have this classmate that uses they, them pronouns. You're nailing it. You've, um, a close friend of yours came out to you. You've asked, who do you want to know? They've talked about that. You're keeping that confidence. And sometimes the answer is they want you to tell people. When I came out to my mom, she said, hey, do you want me to tell your cousins? I was like, yes, please. I don't want to deal with that. I would love it if you could tell my cousins. But if she had just decided to tell them without checking with me first, that would have been harmful. So now I want you to think about that community allyship. And that's taking a little bit of a step back of zooming out from that one-on-one -on -one to how do we help this community. And the first thing is keep doing that research. Being here, awesome. You're doing that research. Continuing to read through these and looking at stuff online, going to Google, going to Wikipedia, awesome. You're doing your research. I'm happy to be a research, and Ellen has my contact info. I'm happy if you want to shoot questions to me, and either I can answer them or I can find some resources that can. We don't want to assume that folks in our life have to be educators. We don't want to assume that simply because someone is trans, they want to be an educator about trans identity. We don't want to assume that because someone is Muslim, they want to tell us about Muslim identity. We don't want to assume that because someone has a disability, they want to tell us about what life is like living with a disability. We can do some Googling on our own. Does that make sense? And again, some of that depends on the relationship. I have close friends who we're comfortable talking about dating, and I ask about their dating life, and they ask about my dating life, and I ask about their sex life, and they ask about my sex life. That feels very different than a random person in a Starbucks going, hey, you're trans, right? What's sex like as a trans person? Those are very different questions. And so we want to think about when do we need to go do our own research? And the last thing on sort of that community level is speak up. One of the favorite moments of allyship, I'm really singing Pete's praises, I'll have to text him later, is I was at a party, and my friend Pete was in the other room, and he didn't know that I could overhear this, and I heard someone say something really messed up about gender. I don't remember what at this point, but something that was like really problematic, left trans people out, was sort of homophobic. I was about to get up and go to the other room, and before I did, I heard Pete say, well, Becca's talked about this a lot, and I think you're wrong because... That was awesome allyship because Pete was speaking up on behalf of LGBT people even when he didn't know I was listening. We have the power to speak up and say, hey, I don't agree with that. And one of the things that I want to empower you to do, you don't need to be an expert to do that. You can say, I don't know everything. I, I want to check with Rebecca. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in touch with her. But what you said makes me uncomfortable, and I, I really don't like that language. We don't have to be an expert to still speak up. We can say, I was a big fan of the show How I Met Your Mother, until the final season drove it into the ground, but I'm, I'm OK. I'm recovering. Um, and there was someone in the writer's room who just thought trans jokes were really funny. 
Like every couple of episodes, there was a joke about a man in a dress, or there was a joke about she used to be a dude. And if you were watching that show with friends, that would be an opportunity to say, that's kind of fucked up. And it can be just that. It can be as simple as, that joke makes me uncomfortable because it seems like it's really making fun of trans people. And I met Rebecca. She's OK. I don't really want to be mean to her. So at the very, very least, opportunities to speak up and to say, hey, I don't think that's the way to do this. I don't think that's the way to say this. I don't think that's very nice. And then moving from that sort of interpersonal small group to some of these system level things is where the speaking up moves from that sort of one on one or like at a party, hey, that joke really makes me uncomfortable, to zooming out a little bit and starting to think about how to change schools and cities and governments and society. And the first and maybe the most important part of that is this idea of intersectionality. Can anyone here define intersectionality for me? Anyone want to take a stab at it? Yes. Absolutely. And it's the idea that we aren't just one thing. I am not only trans, I'm also Jewish, and I'm also a geek, and I'm also a cat owner, and I'm also an uh, aunt, and I'm also a daughter, and I'm also this long list of things. And I'm also white, and I'm also middle class, and I'm also all of these things that overlap. And for me, as a white, college-educated, stably employed, insured, financially uh, secure, parentally supported, able-bodied, um, binary presenting, meaning going back to that idea of a binary, I'm presenting as a normal woman, that is a very, very, very different experience from a trans person of color, or a trans person in a wheelchair, or a trans person who is two or three times my age or a trans person who doesn't have family support. And so when we think about supporting trans people, we want to make sure we're supporting everyone, not just trans people that are convenient to support. Because at the end of the day, I'm a pretty safe trans person. And what I mean by that is I look normal. I'm using big air quotes around that word. And I'm able to operate in these spaces where, like, I went to college so I can operate in these spaces, or I am middle class so I can operate in these spaces, or I have health insurance so I can operate in these spaces. And we'd want to think about, we want to include people who aren't in those ways or who aren't fitting those expectations. Because if we only help a certain type of trans person, we're going to leave a ton of people out. And so when we think about how do we support all trans people, we want to look at all of those different parts of identity. And the ones that are the biggest in our society right now, excuse me, are usually going to be race and class. Not because those are the only important things. As I said, we want to make sure that we're supporting trans people with disabilities. We want to make sure we're supporting trans people of different education levels. We want to make sure we're supporting all trans people. But in particular, if I, as a white person, get pulled over by a police officer, my experience is going to be fundamentally different than a person of color. And in particular, fundamentally different than someone who's black. And acknowledging that, at the very least being able to say, yes, that is true, and then taking a step further and saying, and now what do we do about it, is moving from being an ally to individual trans people, which is super important, to being an ally to the trans community. Does that distinction make sense? Any questions about that? Because I realize that that can be a little bit of a leap if you haven't thought about things that way before. So I want to give an opportunity to pause there while I take a sip of water. And to give some specific examples of how that can play out. I'm from Chicago. And on paper, Chicago is really awesome for trans people. Chicago has had uh, protection around gender identity and expression for many, many years. 
Chicago has a police department that has made um, specific policies around supporting trans people and making sure that trans people are treated in the way that matches their identity. Uh, Chicago is certainly liberal and has a gay neighborhood and has all of these ways that on paper is really great for LGBT people. And also, there were a series of incidents a couple years ago where trans women of color, particularly black trans women, were being stopped by police officers walking from the train to their apartment because the assumption was the only reason a black trans woman would be walking down the street was because she was a prostitute. And so repeatedly, day after day after day after day, these police officers were stopping and harassing black trans women for walking while trans. And that's not something that those policies on the surface would address. And so when we're thinking about how do we support all trans people, we need to make sure that it's not just an issue of policy, which is really important and is great, and Chicago deserves some credit for that, but that how those policies play out isn't, doesn't have blind spots. And that was a huge systemic issue that on paper, trans people were being supported. In reality, white middle class trans people were being supported. And other trans people, trans people with different economic status or trans people who weren't white, were being screwed over over and over and over and over again. Does that make sense? And that's just one example of how those blind spots can, can function, where we think this policy is great, but how does it work differently for someone who's a different age or race or class or um, economic level or computer literacy or any of these other things that play out across our day-to-day -day life? Next thing to think about, and this can be particularly important at places like school campuses, is think about what's called gender policing. And gender policing is this idea that men are over here, women are over here, and it is my job as a red-blooded American to defend that. So a big place that this comes up is bathrooms and locker rooms. The idea that I, as a random citizen, am in charge of telling people what bathroom they should be in. And when we're thinking about schools, when we're thinking about communities, we want to make sure that we're supporting everyone. So first, if no one's bothering you, just let them do their business. I promise you, the vast majority of people who are trying to use the bathroom, that's all they want to do. One of my coworkers has a really great line, which I like, which is, I want to mind my business, so I can do my business and go about my business. And it's that simple. So when we're thinking about bathroom policing, first and foremost, we want to make sure that there are places that are going to be safe and secure for people who don't feel comfortable in, one bath in a men's bathroom or a women's room. Are there single occupancy bathrooms? Sometimes these are called family bathrooms. Sometimes these are accessibility bathrooms. And again, that helps people who aren't trans, too. That helps someone who's a caretaker with someone who needs accessibility support in a bathroom. Or it helps someone, excuse me, who's a parent with a young child who doesn't want to have to deal with being in one of those tiny stalls. And it also helps trans folks who might not feel safe or comfortable in one uh, bathroom or the other. And it helps other people. It helps me when I ate something that disagreed with me and I want as much distance between me and the rest of the world while I go use a public bathroom. Thinking about gendered spaces, thinking about locker rooms, thinking about bathrooms absolutely helps trans people. It helps other people too. And then in particular, we want to think about systems. And what I mean by that is when you're making paperwork, when there's something someone has to fill out, how is that going to be different for a trans person? If there's just two checkboxes, male and female, you're leaving people out. If there's three checkboxes, male, female, and other, maybe a step in the right direction, but you're still leaving people out. Or at least you're saying there's normal and then there's everyone else. And so we want to think about when we're creating systems, how do we do that in a way that supports people? So some specific examples. And I don't know the answer to this for, for this community um, and for this school. 
if I want to change my name on the attendance sheet? First of all, can I do that without having legally changed my name? Because what I show up as in the system shouldn't require a legal name change. And second, how hard is it to do? In a perfect world, I could just do it from my phone on some student portal website, but at the very least, it shouldn't require um, jumping through hoops. So thinking about things like that. Is it possible for me to change the name that shows up on the attendance sheet even if my legal name is different? What if I'm living at home with my parents and I'm not out to them, but I do want my teacher to see my preferred name? How does that work? These are things that can be really tricky system problems. I want to acknowledge that. As someone who has a computer science background, I understand that some of these systems go back to the 60s and 70s, and they expect very, very specific data. That is not an excuse to just throw up your hands and say, well, I guess we can't. It's a really good excuse to say we can't today, but it's not a good excuse to say we can't ever. And so thinking about how do we, as a community, make sure that at every level these systems are going to support trans people and in particular are going to support all trans people. What if it's a trans person who isn't comfortable or familiar with computers? What if it's a trans person whose English isn't their first language? What if it's a trans person who can't go up a flight of stairs? How do we make sure that we're supporting not only convenient trans folks, but all trans folks? And then the last thing that I would say is listen. And what I mean by that is I can't tell you what the most important thing for your community is going to be. I can say some maybes. Maybe it's gender neutral bathrooms. Maybe it's being able to change your name on the attendance form without a legal name change. Maybe it's resources for finding hormones and doctors. Maybe it's financial support. But only this community is going to be able to answer which of those has the highest priority. It may be that the bathrooms aren't perfect, but they're good enough. We really need this name change stuff dealt with. Or it may be that the community that's here has had legal name changes, so that's not as important. We really need this bathroom issue taken care of. And I can't tell you one way or the other. And if there isn't a community who's excited about that activism. So if you've reached out to trans folks on campus, you've reached out to the LGBT community in the area, and they're like, yeah, we really don't know, or I'm dealing with my own stuff, I don't have time to be an advocate, you can still be an ally and say, OK, well, we're going to start somewhere. We don't know what's perfect. We don't know what is the exact thing that this community needs. But while we're listening, while we're reaching out, while we're trying to figure that out, we're going to at least take some baby steps. And we're going to ask Rebecca, or we're going to flip a coin, or we're going to see which thing seems easiest, and we're going to start somewhere. Because there's, there's a phrase that I really like, which is, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And what that means is sometimes we try to make things exactly right, but that takes so long that we never actually get anything done. And so I would much rather see people say, well, I don't know if this is going to be perfect for the trans community, but let's at least take some baby steps. And if the trans community, if we can work with them and they say, actually, let's do this differently, we're going to, take, we're going to let them take the lead. But in the meantime, we don't want to just sit on our hands doing nothing. And so thinking about how do we listen and engage how do we make sure that we're reaching out to the trans community? And how do we make sure that we're thinking about all trans folks, not just a certain type of trans folks? And what I would really encourage people to do is to take some time reading through this packet. And it's not perfect because nothing is. I'm sure there's stuff I'm missing from this one sheet. The gender bread person, which I like, isn't perfect either. First of all, the photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy has some small text that's tough to read. But I'm sure there's stuff on here, too, that isn't perfect. The language around asking for pronouns, I like that, too. I'm sure there's stuff that's missing from there. And then this LGBT terminology page, I promise you, 
there is no consensus on what any of these terms mean that every single person is going to agree on. Unfortunately, there was not a vote. I was not elected queen of the trans, and so no one has appointed me to be able to decide what these words mean. I can tell you what's generally true, and that's a good rule of thumb, but this is an ongoing process, and it, we're never quite done. And so I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight, and I really want to encourage people to keep these conversations going. Reach out to me through Ellen. Have these conversations with each other. Do some research on Google or on Wikipedia. Have these conversations on Facebook, and keep pushing things forward. Because I would much rather see people try their hardest, sometimes fail, and sometimes succeed, than not try at all. Um, we do have a little bit of time both now, and then I'm certainly happy to stick a little bit past 8. So I'm going to open it up. Questions, comments, thoughts, um, talking about how awesome my cats are, go. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm never good at breaking for that applause. Yes.